Julian Rose is one of the pioneers of UK organic farming, having commenced the conversion in 1975. In 1984, he joined the Soil Association Board and campaigned vigorously for organic farming in a time when these methods were not known. He received his notoriety when he took a cow to the Hyde Park Festival of Farming and protested against the government ban of unpasteurized milk. He then went on to develop a mixed organic enterprise, selling only locally and refusing to sell to supermarkets. He developed a theory of local consumption and production called the Proximity Principle. Julian has written and broadcast extensively and has just completed a book, Changing Course for Life, about the radical changes needed to bring new hope to society. He is an environmental activist and a defender of peasant and family farming traditions throughout the world. We know how busy you are with all of your projects, Julian. So what is your number one project at the moment? Yes, um, it's never very easy to uh, prioritize projects, all of which seem incredibly urgent and uh, never very easy. However, I would say that the number one project at the moment is to do two things. It has to be divided, I think, into two things. In order to make something new happen, um, which we're trying to do both here at Hardwick and in Poland, where we have an eco-center and the International Coalition to Protect the Polish Countryside, which I'm president of, and Jadwiga Wapata is vice president and founder. We have to develop a grassroots approach which attracts people back to the land. At the same time, we have to try and stop the worst thing that will destroy that potential of those people coming together as a community on the land to succeed. It, we can't do one or the other. So in a way, the top project at the moment is to block the advancement of genetically modified organisms, which have the capacity to totally destroy any ecological, um, sustainable, properly managed land um, work where good food quality is the end issue and purity of food, etc., because of the fact that cross-pollination between genetically modified plants and ordinary and organic plants means that those plants will never be able to be redressed back to their old genetic variety. So that absolutely crucial. We put this as number one project to stop this. Uh, mostly the work at the moment is in, uh, I'm involved in this is in Poland. Basically looking at Poland as a country which could be quite easily turned over to GMO and no one would even notice. You know. So there we have a massive undertaking which is to raise awareness about the implications of this type of farming altogether, not just genetically modified organisms, which is the top of a pyramid of monocultural agrochemical farming, which has been going on in Europe for the last 40, 50, 60 years. But, you know, what is the, f what is the reason? Who are the people doing this type of farming? Is that what Polish people want? You know, what about the food chain? What about the great quality of Polish food in the traditional sense? What about the 1,500,000 small farmers with seven hectare lands practicing peasant farming techniques which are uh, organic by default, you could say. By default because they can't afford the pesticides. So the number one priority in, in project in this sense is to do two things. To start a movement back to the land which involves people who are aware practicing um, self-sufficiency in energy and in renewable energy, of course, and in farming, and in even house building using clay, straw, bricks, wood, and all the different re renewable resources we have available to us, but simultaneously battling to stop the worst thing from destroying the new seeds which are growing up. So I divided it into two, but I think that will be clear to people that you can't do one or the other. What are your thoughts on where mankind is headed over the coming year, and what do you consider our greatest challenges? Actually, I think our greatest challenges are weaning ourselves off the propaganda machine which runs most of our lives. We have to dig deep. You really can't take many steps forward unless you take many steps d deeper into yourself. They, the two things go hand in hand with one another. And the greatest catastrophe in the West, because I think we have to talk about the West separately from, if you like, the third world or the, or the southern w area of the world, is that we have had the arrogance to believe over two or three hundred years that we know the answers and that we can find solutions to everything we do wrong. 
they can be some technological, you know, whiz kid solution to everything we do wrong. And therefore we can sit watching entertainment on television, we can buy gizmos, we can leave fires on when we should be turning them off, we can do all sorts of crazy things. Because the propaganda machine is telling us this is the most important. If you're not a consumer, you're not part of the status quo. And we have to cease being frightened of departing from the status quo and standing aside from it. And without being totally impassioned and, and sort of angry all the time about it, we have to criticize it and we have to show how it is completely unsustainable and how it's destroying our planet. The only way we can really do this is by examining our own lives individually and saying, well, what am I doing in my own life which is contributing to something much better? You know, what am I doing positive to overcome this scenario? Many people fall at the first hurdle and say, well, what can I do? What can I do? You know? And this is a massive mistake because they're only thinking of yourself, rather little possibly, but you'd nevertheless something. But when you think everybody is saying, what can I do all at once, like a chorus all over the world, you can think one click of the finger and if they all said, I know I can do something, we would change the world overnight. So we're in psychologically imprisoned by our own creations. So the single most important thing for mankind in the coming years is to get out of that prison and get active and turn the world around. So Julian, your book, Changing Course for Life, Local Solutions to Global Problems, it's a manual for change wherein you rec where you foresee a new renaissance for hope. So does this mean that you're actually hopeful for the future? I do. I've always been uh, someone who sees the future as hopeful. And the, r the reason for this is, in the course of my working life and travels in many different countries of the world, I've always noticed that the spark of humanity shines through in even the most extraordinarily difficult situations. In the book, I address this issue by writing, well actually in a certain sense it's a series of essays, where I look at each different area, be it economics, be it environment, be it health, be it culture, be it education, uh, all these different areas I look at and I briefly describe the historical phenomena which has led them into a state of semi-collapse or at least impoverishment. And then I suggest what the solution might be, an immediate solution, not a sort of distant one, but something we could do right away to bring about some process of change. Because I think we need to understand what we've done wrong before we can really put things right. So we have to have some sense of history. We have to learn by our mistakes of the past and not just ignore them. Otherwise we go on repeating the same pattern over and over and over again. So the book is like a manual, yes, you said it very well, and that means that people who read it, and I've had some, I'm very happy that I've had some very positive reactions from people who have said, it's a, this, this book's helped me uh, to channel my energies in, into a very positive way of thinking about things. And actually, in Poland, we've even had people come and say, we want to now work with you, you know, I read your book, now I want to come and work with you, what are we doing? What's happening tomorrow? <laughs> Fantastic. Which is, which is great, and I'm very happy about that. And um, I just hope the, uh, you know, the word gets spread. And of course, there's plenty of books on the marketplace, so it's very difficult to decide what to buy these days. It's an easy book to read, but it's packed with um, interesting information. And I think it's got the potential to act as a spark to help this creation of this new renaissance. Uh, because even in the greatest, darkest times, you know, round the corner, I think they say the darkest hour is just before dawn just around that corner could be something absolutely magnificent. And I believe in it. What can we as consumers do to put an end to GMO? That's a very important question. And th I'm conscious of the fact that nearly everybody watching this film will consider themselves to be in that category. I mean, it is crucial, absolutely crucial, that what we call consumers, and it's a ridiculous word, as we said before, but we know what we're talking about. It's absolutely crucial that this, sp this, this, these millions of people across the world who have sort of gone to sleep on the food chain and think, and believe what they see on television and believe what they read in newspapers and believe, you know, what some agrochemical salesman might say or anyone else for that matter, even the doctor, of course. Th that is the most powerful force for change. Um, there is an indication, and here in England, actually, we already have seen examples of it, including on my own farm, which is people suddenly have decided they want to start growing their own food and what you might call just consumers, you know, ordinary people in cities and villages. And, and now, 
you know, we have in a tradition in England of a, what's something called allotment plots, which used to surround every village, and people could grow, almost become self-sufficient in vegetables using these allotment plots. But they went out of business uh, 40 or so years ago, and they just had weeds. And nobody ever thought they were going to be used again. They thought they'd use them for housing developments or anything. And suddenly, about two or three years ago, people suddenly started thinking, we want to revive those plots. We want to start growing our own food. To the extent that every all over England, as our waiting list, uh, all those plots are suddenly growing food again. And as I uh, told you earlier on, I developed on my own farm an area of land where people can now come and they can grow their own food on it for a very small rental uh, sum. They can come and grow their own food. I would recommend that as the first major step for any what we call consumer to do. Because if you want to understand things, if you want to take control of your destiny, you have to have at least a degree of working knowledge about the subject you're interested in. And if you're not interested in food, well, you're not interested in life, as far as I'm concerned. So the first step would be try it. And if you're living in a town, what about your window ledge? What about opening the window and putting a seed box in there? You know, what about harvesting some of the rainwater coming down from outside? What about if you've got a flat roof, starting a green roof? There's thousands of very creative and exciting things you can do. And it's always best to start small. Because if you go wrong when you're small, you don't waste too much time or too much money. But if you see things working, keep going. And you'll find other people doing the same thing. And all of a sudden, we have a massive greening movement that is just going ahead, regardless of what anybody says. So. I think in the consumer we have the most important tool of all for change, once they're activated. So then, what do you do for fun when you're not working? Ha <laughs> ha! Well, fun, I find work fun, you see. <laughs> so I'm a difficult case. <laughs> I don't fit into the average sort of, you must relax after five o'clock type thing. Well, I'm very fortunate in this. You know, I've, I've partly been able to, for, d for reasons that I was born into a family which didn't have to work hard from nine to five. They had to work hard, but it wasn't in an excessive way. And there, I have to say, before really answering the question, I have, I recognize that the huge numbers of people are not able to reflect sufficiently deeply on the state of the society they're in because they cannot free themselves from the daily chore of trying to survive. You know, I mean, that is why capitalism has failed. And capitalism is supposed to make it possible for people to get on beyond that phase, and not just the top end, not just the top of the pyramid, but right down to the grassroots level. And forget it, it's been a total disaster. In fact, as we all know, the wealth gap is getting worse and worse. The top end's receiving absurd sums of money, and the bottom end virtually nothing. So it's over. It's actually over. So what do I do when I feel that I need to get a break and get some more imaginative ideas. I tend to uh, play the guitar, and I read books, and I go on walks in the mountains. And uh, between those three things, I get pretty good relaxation. Play.